thanks for being here. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you everyone for being your patient here. Uh, my uh, Welcome everyone, my name is Ad Prashori and I work for Trello Society. I'm part of the Community Development Program, which includes Shalini Honda, Bianca Salamanca, Noor Alhamadi, and Raj Nupain. I wanted to talk about our Community Development Program. Uh, we work in the city of Calgary with residents and organizations at a macro level. So we're not working one-on-one -on -one, uh, with clients. And we're there to get folks' voice heard on interests and concerns. Uh, this year was a challenge year for us. We had a huge staff turnover with folks moving on to other opportunities. Uh, this left us feeling very vulnerable and asking us, uh, how do we start and how are new folks gonna immerse in the community? Our presentation will be focusing on community immersion by sharing stories on relationship building, empowerment, capacity building, and relationship maintenance. Uh, how we immerse in the community during organization changes team turnover and placement of CD workers in new communities from a relationship focus. Everything in our presentation will tie into relationship work. So I'm gonna pass it over to Bianca. So oh, thanks, Ad. So hi, my name is Bianca Salamanca. I have been with Trellis since 2015. I started as an outreach worker supporting with community events. So this is when I was first introduced to community development. After this, I just did case management one-to-one -one support with families and individuals. So I am fairly new to this position. I started in March. So um, what I'm gonna talk about is relationship building. We all know the importance of it. Well, we sh I, I know for one-to-one -one support, how important it was to build trust and honest and openness with the families I was working with. So I had to learn how to transfer that into a community. So I kept asking myself, like, how do I do this? Who do I connect with? And who, and how do I even start? So what I did is I went to the stakeholders. Stakeholders look different in every community. It's anybody that cares about the community, such as churches, schools, community associations, libraries, and community leaders. So when I first started, I was given handover notes. These actually saved my life because they were from previous workers about an events and initiatives they were involved with. Um, they also had contacts for city social workers and community leaders. After this, my mission was to connect with organizations, residents, and informal groups. So my first one was the Alex Food Center because I had, I was passed over the baking break group. So this is a free program that is done in person at the Alex and online. So I had to go to the Alex to see the kitchen, learn the policies and see what days they had available. Um, after this, I had to contact the core leaders of the Baking Break group. So I call them, I email them, I text them, no response, they ghosted me. I was kind of feel, def I felt defeated so what I did is I contacted Ad. Ad did support in the past with the baking break. So he did have a good relationship with them. So what he did is he called them and he also emailed them. But when he emailed, he CC'd me. After that, they reached out to me. We started to meet at residents' home. We had coffee. We talked in a personal level as well and as well as what they want to see with the baking break group. After this, I, my, I tried to go into any meetings that had any sort of stakeholders. One of them was the basic needs meeting where I met a pastor at Oak Park Church. She explained to me the food pantry that they do there. It's free food for families or individuals and they get this food from Costco. So we were able to set up a meeting and I was listening to what she had to say about the community, the needs, the gaps and the strengths. After that, I tried to reach, reach out to like past relationships that I had and then just explain what I do and to listen to, again, the community needs, uh, strengths and gaps. I also went to the FRN, Family Resource Networks, try to connect to as many city social workers as I could. My next mission was to be visible. What I try to do um, is go to any community events, programs happening. I was invited to the Oak Park uh, Food Pantry where I set up a resource table and I just mingled with the residents and listened to the residents. 
I also went to the Alex, again, just to listen, uh, the FRN. I had a city social worker ask me to support with a volunteer lunch for the residents that support with the food pantry. So what I was doing there was asset mapping, trying to get the strengths, the gaps of the community. And because I'm fairly new and we, I have no certain area, this is always gonna be continuing. I'm always building connections, uh, relationships change and community change. Uh, now I'm gonna pass it to Shalini. Thanks, Bianca. Morning, everyone. My name is Shalini and I have been working with Chalas for eight years primarily in the Northeast quadrant of Calgary. But while working there, I was able to develop strong relationships with agencies, grassroots organizations, and residents. Um, a few months ago, I was moved to Northwest quadrant and started working out of the Northwest Calgary, and I was very confused where to start. So how I started was I started browsing online to understand what these neighborhoods have to offer. And I started by cold calling or sending emails to introduce myself and my role. Ad had been a great support and he supported me to connect with the local FRN closer to home. Um, as Bianca mentioned earlier, being visible in the community is really important. So I started visiting different locations such as the rec center, Vivo, or the libraries, community associations and connected with staff and resident over there. And I started attending the monthly interagency meeting, which actually helped me a lot in connecting with other organizations already established in these communities. And I built connections with the city social worker, the schools, faith groups, which helped me in understanding the needs in the neighborhood and also to understand the interest and ask from the community. So in role, our role as city workers, we are all empowering residents through an asset-based community approach. and. In this presentation, we will share different ways on how we are doing that. So I'm starting with the first pillar, collaboration. So it is important to work with other organization, residents and stakeholders so we can work together to share a similar vision, values and framework. So to learn about the needs and scale in the community, the approach that I had was to have pop-up tables or at different locations to share resources and listen to the residents' voice. So during our conversation with the residents, we noticed that um, there are a lot of women who are looking forward to becoming financially independent. And they were not able to take a job because of the family responsibilities. However, they wanted to support their families financially and most importantly, find a niche for themselves. So at, to address this need, we started a Share Your Skills series and every month we would give an opportunity to a resident to share their skills and also learn from each other. Um, to teach them more or to guide them more about how to start a small business or a community markets, we collaborated with other agencies uh, such as Momentum, and we organized workshop and to provide more information about how to start a small business. Another collaboration we did was with Calgary Dollars, which shared information about community markets and provided information about starting as, um, local markets. So the residents uh, created a planning committee and they worked on it and held a market where they showcased the skills that they had learned in our previous sessions. Um, apart from those, they also learned skills such as creating posters, promoting, advertising, or marketing their materials and organizing a big event. So these markets have been immensely successful and are held every quarter, giving opportunities to small vendors or home-based businesses. Uh, another collaboration that I have been doing is with immigrant serving agencies to help residents from different demographic or needs. Um, because of the funding, these agencies often have a set eligibility criteria, which limits the residents from accessing those programs. But with collaboration from Trellis, we can mitigate those limitations and make our programs more inclusive. Um, Another collaboration that I'm gonna talk about is with the local community associations. Um, they have been very helpful in understanding the needs and ask from the community. So their staff shares the needs and I try to bridge those gaps with finding the appropriate resources. The community association actually serves five communities in the neighborhood that I'm working with and it has a monthly newsletter. This newsletter actually helps me a lot in sharing resources or information about upcoming programs and reach out to about 60,000 households over there, which is, which is a huge number. Um, 
To support the need around basic needs, we also create resource sheets, some related to specific neighborhoods and some certified, which we keep updating periodically. We share these resources with our residents and encourage them to pass on the information as the need be. Um, during this sharing, we also recognize that there is a need regarding digital literacy. So we, how we mitigated that was we connected with high school youths with, who were looking for more volunteer opportunities. And we started matching up them with the seniors or adults who were um, trying to learn those skills. So the skills that we shared was like um, how to create an email or a WhatsApp group so they can connect it with their families and friends. So it helped in breaking social isolation. And now we see that those residents are more connected with their families and their friends, even back home. Um, and they have added me as well to some of their words group and I keep getting updates about them, which is really nice. Um, the skill that they learned helped us as well and in sharing the resources electronically and in more timely manner. It helped in building capacity in the residents and the residents taking ownership and feeling more involved in the community. At this note, I'm gonna pass it over to Ad so he can talk more about other pillars. Thank you, Shalini. Uh, again, uh, I work, uh, although we our program is citywide, I predominantly have been working in Greater Forest Lawn uh, because initially we were assigned a couple communities. I already have established relationships. I've been there a lifetime with Trellis and sometimes I feel I started when I was a toddler. Uh, so nobody filed any grievances on that. And I have been, I saw all the the meetings and folks have connected, I'm still immersing and I still connect with residents. I do things a bit differently, uh, although some of the same things that others are doing is I do a lot of door knocking and I found that's an intimate way to connect with residents. And when I do door knocking, I'm not actually assessing issues and needs and deficits or, or even strengths. I'm actually just, just building relationship by letting people know about information and resource in the community. And the relationships will just happen naturally. And if people are gonna share information, it's just gonna be a natural conversation. Uh, there's crime in the area and giving people an opportunity to share those skills through the, I also do pop-up tables, resource tables. We do similar stuff. The other thing unique about our program is we can now partner with uh, trellis programs. So another piece we're trying to do is connect with programs for opportunities around CD. So there's always opportunities and there's always learning and change. Uh, so the second pillar is around identifying service gaps and interests. Uh, what we do is we're always giving opportunities for residents to share their ideas and opportunities to empower and for them to take action. Uh, Bianca and Al, uh, Shalini already shared a lot about being visible. So I'm not gonna get into that. Uh, the, however, this process can be informal. Like we're, we can be meeting folks at community dinners, informal dinners, or at organizations. An example that I have from one of the initiatives is uh, we had a client that used to work for Trellis. Their file was closed. Uh, they were connected to me uh, in the community. They did call me a year later saying uh, during COVID they were experiencing discrimination and racism. I gave this individual an opportunity to get their voice heard, met with other folks, and that led to taking action on how, what we can do to educate and inform the community. And they were always leading it. We might've made the decisions, but they were the voice of how we go forward. Uh, the group is called Communities Overcoming Racism. And it's been up and down, but that's part of community development, it's okay. Uh, the next pillar is building capacity. This is huge and it's ongoing. And sometimes we talk about building capacity, we're looking at resident capacity, but what we've learned is also we're building organizational capacity and our team capacity, because I think we can learn from each other and agencies can learn from each other. Uh, so opportunities for residents has been uh, supporting around grant applications, taking minutes, sharing minutes, uh, even emceeing an event. And if someone is not comfortable, then how could we make someone comfortable and what do they want? A lot of it is listening. Uh, there's also skills that aren't always talked about that are important when you work with residents or even organizations uh, like communication skills, feedback, conflict resolution. I've had residents in a conflict. I've had organizations disagreeing with residents and not everybody has those skills. So it, it's important to learn, develop those skills because you can role model and also teach others on handle and learning those skills where it can improve things. Uh, these challenges are not negative. They're actually encouraging uh, the, because it gives an opportunity to learn something. Uh, the community initiative group was an example of six residents I work with. Uh, 
they've been taking leadership on so many things. Initially, I was doing maybe most of the grant and stuff, uh, leading it. And now this group honestly can lead the group on their own. They're doing grant proposals on their own, shopping, giving feedback. Uh, another piece that Trellis is really uh, values is uh, feedback informed treatment. Uh, to doing proper capacity, we need to find out what we're doing is actually working. We actually uh, have conversations, uh, verbal or paper feedback, if folks, what folks want in the future for events, uh, if they would like to share a skill or if they want to volunteer. I think there's always opportunities and people just have to be asked. And some people don't even realize they have gifts that they can share. So we always want to give people a voice, but that also comes with trust and a relationship. Uh, and all the stuff that we are doing is uh, resident led and very trauma informed. I'm going to pass it over to Raj and Noor. They're, they're going to talk a bit more about that. Thank you, Ad. First of all, uh, it reminded me of something. I was uh, kind of uh, thinking so hard to find the answer to the question that uh, Lee posed, where to go, uh, if you're new to the CD world, where to go and find the proper tool. Now I have that answer. I have the answer to that question. And I can come up with a suggestion to reach out to the folks like Ad, who has spent their whole life doing CD work. Anyway, okay, thanks, thanks Ad, again. Raj. Just, you just age me. And second of all, I'll give you thirty dollars for the compliments. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you, Ad, again, and good morning, everyone. I'm Raz, and I'm working uh, as a community development worker uh, with Trellis at Genesis Center. And the Genesis Center basically is a very busy hub because there are multiple resources such as YMCA, library, preschool, swimming pools, gym, link classes, programs, and other uh, under the same uh, roof. Because we are kind of based in a specific community hub, Noor and I work together and our city activities might look different than what our friends at Bianca and Salini do in a day-to-day -day basis. However, our common goal is to empower the residents through various activities that we do. Uh, Noor and I uh, will be talking about different things we need to keep into consideration while doing CD work today. One of the most important thing is trauma-informed practices. And I'm going to talk about a little bit what we do, um, how we deal with the people around here at the hub. Talking about the relevance of trauma-informed approach in the community development, we focus on the benefits of adopting it first, as well as the implication it holds for individuals and communities. And we actually practice this in a package rather than a piece of it every time. I generally, we, when we meet the residents, we start ensuring their physical, emotional, and emotional safety. We bring them in a safe physical environment and make them feel secure and make them feel supported. Once we do that, we try to keep ourselves very transparent and consistent when it comes to our interaction with uh, the residents and also uh, our communications. After uh, we get to know them better, when we talk to them, when we listen to their stories, and after we get to know them better, we always motivate them to identify the strengths they have and take part in decision-making process actively, rather than us suggesting them to do something that we feel right for them. Right? So it is the right um, uh, thing to do to uh, empower them to take decision on their own rather than what we think right for them. Right. So at the end, and we all do all these things to, in the belief that they foster healing. Whatever we do, uh, we make sure that foster the healing and recovery from trauma by creating safe and supportive environment to the client and reducing the risk of unintentional re-traumatization. In other words, we believe uh, this um, heals wounds and creates supportive environment that promote resilience and recovery, which we believe is capacity building. So we have to be very resilient. We have to be very mindful in practicing uh, trauma-informed approach at our day-to-day -day work. 
Now I will pass it over to my colleague Noor for the next part of the presentation, which is clear communication. It is over to you, Noor. Thank you, Raj. Uh, my name is Noor, and I as well work at the Genesis Center. I have um, I've done community development work for a few months so far, and I am sharing my experience about commu clear communication and community work. Um, from my experience, um, personal connection is the key to establish um, a strong relationship between the residents. And I find that um, when openly communicating and freely communicating with empathy, um, being informal and organic, um, I feel like it's the best approach I, I see from my experience to, um, to, to have that connection with the residents. Um, having that personal connection with the resident and making them feel comfortable to um, engage in a, in a conversation makes it easier to give and receive fad, feedbacks. And with feedbacks, I feel like it's a way to in, in, um, encourage growth and to in, um, ignite growth as well. Um, when practicing clear communication within the CD work, um, active listening um, is goes hands in hands in hand. Um, and I have experienced that um, um, when we are mindful of mindful of when mindful of communicating with the resident, that we keep in mind that um, motivation reward and acknowledging their strength and accomplishments um, helps the residents to to flourish and to grow and to really look at themselves and reflect to themselves and see that yes they have so much accomplishments and so much potential of growth um, and we trellis always encourage growth in, in many forms and um and steps um from my experience um things that like thank you cards and laptops or gift cards, all things we try to encourage, nice words, support, all these, we all do practice to encourage the residents um, and, to, and to seek their full potential when it comes to growth. And clear communication is, we, we all practice this in, in our everyday, um, everyday practice, everyday work. Um, and it's just a way to, um, you and the resident kind of set set clear um, <clears throat> clear um, uh, solutions or clear supports to what the residents need, and as well to build the capacity of the resident. Um, I will pass it along to my teammate Raj. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Again, uh, now when we talk about uh, community building, uh, it is basically uh, related to uh, establishing a relationship. While building a relationship, uh, it is essential for us to be able to establish a clear boundaries with the residents to ensure the work we do is effective and also sustainable. So I'm gonna talk about some of uh, the points highlighting on the boundaries to consider. The uh, on, uh, first and foremost, uh, would be maintaining professional relationship with the community members. Especially when we work at the hub, we try to uh, have that professional relationship with the members or uh, the service seekers who, uh, who we encounter with here every day. We avoid uh, engaging in personal relationship or taking on responsibilities beyond our, the scope of our role. If residents ask us the support, which is uh, not under our role, we respectfully explain uh, that it is beyond our role. Having said this, we won't turn them down. Rather, we direct them to the right authority who can help them out. Another would be emotional boundaries. We need to be very stable emotionally when we uh, deal with the, the, the residents. Uh, and it, uh, we generally practice empathy with the individuals, uh, but at the same time, we avoid taking on their emotional burdens on our head. Likewise, time and resource constraints. The time and resource is always limited. So we, what we do here, we communicate clearly with the residents what we can and 
what we cannot do in, you know, with the time and resource that is available with us. If the hub is too busy sometimes, sometimes it is very, very busy. And if residents comes to us asking for um, some support or to spend a lot of time with them, we simply say that we won't be available at this time. However, we can help at some other time or we even direct them uh, to other uh, uh, member who is relatively free and willing to help. So these are some of the point, uh, key points that we practice here when it comes to boundaries. Also, the most important one I would like to highlight is self-care. We need to maintain and Sorry, Raj, we've got a couple minutes. So do you want to just quickly wrap up? Because I've still oh, got okay. Okay. okay, I'll do that. We, need, we, we generally maintain our, uh, our, our well-being while working as a city, uh, while involving ourselves in the city work. Uh, we are physically, because the situation could be physically and emotionally demanding, we often take break from work and go for a walk around the center itself. Or sometimes even we step out for fresh air and go out uh, and have a chat with friends or so on. Well, these are some of the boundaries we practice. However, they, they may vary depending on the specific context and need of the community. And it is crucial to continuously assess and adapt these boundaries while engaging in city work to ensure ethical and impactful practices. Anyway, I'm taking a little bit of a longer time. Yeah, you're so I'll go back minute. to Raj, it's you back took to the both of uh, Coca-Cola there. Thank you. <laughs> I'm back to you. Back, 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 so back to you. The last part is the relationship maintenance. Uh, one of the things we're accommodating to residents, uh, meetings, evenings, uh, person online. Uh, we also do ongoing communication, check in with residents through phone, text, pop in, copy visits, touch base when we, when even when you're moving from an initiative uh, to keep that relationship. Uh, the third part is we maintain feedback. That includes a culture of feedback with organizations, informal questions with organizations about work, surveys at community events, uh, what's working, uh, and we want people to feel safe. I had a resident that was not happy with how I was doing online meetings. That was flattering. It hurt, but that is what you want. Somebody that is going to tell you what I, what I'm, what's not working. Because if you lose the relationship, you're going to lose the outcome. So always remember that. Uh, and then informal conversations. That was mentioned before. It's okay to have informal conversation with residents. I met residents in their backyard uh, for alcohol, kidding. Uh, met them for water and pop and just had conversation about how their lives and how it's going. And that's part of the maintaining relationship. Personal sharing is okay. It's not, you're not doing it to meet your needs. You're doing it to inspire, empower, give hope and encouragement. Uh, community development can be very ambiguous. It can seem frustrating, slow and with little movement. Uh, there is no time limit for community growth. Sometimes it can be unplanned and informal, unstructured and it's okay. This presentation is a reminder that focusing on relationship success can keep you grounded. And I would always lead with relationships. We did it. Thank you, everyone. And now the awkward wait. <laughs>